Okay, great. Um, so, thank you for the introduction, Mark. And um, I'm Luke Hines um, from the UK. You can probably hear by my accent. And uh, I'm in uh, Red Hat CTO as a software engineer. And today we're going to be covering Keyline. Okay, it's a relatively new project. Uh, it's not really hit maturity as yet, but it's 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 making very good progress. And uh, so, so yeah, we'll be exploring that. I'm going to do a, a sort of a, a rough intro introduction to the technology that Keyline relies upon. We then got a middle section where it gets a bit hand, hand wavy, and we talk about the use cases. And then after that, we conclude on uh, what we're currently working on, uh, the community, um, what we plan to work on and, and hope to achieve. Okay, so. I've already done an introduction of myself. Um, so I've worked on security for longer than I can remember now, uh, mainly sort of tooling, a bit of vulnerability management and handling. So I'm on the uh, uh, Kubernetes product security committee, and I've done stuff in OpenStack and, and uh, different sort of uh, projects, open source projects around vulnerability management and, and tools that support the projects as well. So. Um, Let's uh, go into what is the problem, because I think there's a lot of software out there that's, that's looking for a problem to solve, whereas I think the good thing with Keylime is there's a solid problem there for us to address. So as it stands, quite often, secrets reside within the memory, the disk, or the CPU. Okay? Now, that's not to dismiss that there are good protections, such as... Uh, 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 access control, SE Linux, uh, systems hardening and so forth. But as a general rule, your secrets, whether that be, when I, when I refer to secrets, this could be uh, something like a, a TLS certificate, a private key, an SSH key. It typically resides on the disk. And, and the problem with this is that you are then at the mercy of the lower levels of the stack. So what I mean by that is let's say that you... Um, somebody's instantiated a virtual machine or a container, perhaps on AWS or Microsoft Azure or, or whatever the, the uh, provider, you then, you then, um, you then, you know, they inject your SSH key, you log in, you land on the shell, you look around and you think, well, it, it kind of looks okay. So you assume a level of trust, but you have no way of implicitly gaining trust in the supporting layers underneath that abstracted operating system that you have. Okay, so you can only sort of make a kind of a, a loose guess, as in, you know, I trust this provider, why would they want to hack me? But there's no real way of establishing trust in the lower levels of the stack that you're, you're sitting at the top of, especially if you're in a container or a virtual machine. So, I call this the top-down trust blind spot. So I don't know if this is just a, an English saying, but we, we say like when you're driving a car, you have blind spots. So this is essentially your, your wing mirrors. And when you look, there's always a kind of a slice where you can't see. So you can't see the big truck that's coming just as you turn off lanes in a, in a freeway. And that's why I call this the, the top-down trust blind spot. So essentially, we have these layers. So we've got the firmware, uh, the bootloader, perhaps the shim, the host operating system, the hypervisor or the container runtime, and then up into the layer where you sit, which would be, for example, a virtual machine. Or you could you know, potentially have rented a bare metal machine as well. And you don't really have any ideas about the, uh, you know, the, the bootloader, the firmware, and, and, and these things, and, uh, uh, you know, are, are they compromised? Can you trust them? So typically, when a, a lower level of the stack is compromised, sorry, when a lower level of the, yeah, when a lower level of the stack is compromised, then the whole stack can be compromised, and it's very difficult to actually know that as a tenant within those layers. So there are these things that, probably I guess most of you have heard of, they're called trusted platform modules. Okay? And that's the key bit of technology that Keyline relies upon. And uh, TPMs are, they're a specialized chip 
Uh, don't think of them as a crypto accelerator. They're, they have a very simple sign-in engine. So imagine them almost having their own stripped-down version of OpenSSL. So they can perform basic crypto operations, such as creating keys and, and signing artifacts and certificates, and, and a few other things as well, which we'll get on to uh, shortly. Uh, they are pretty much ubiquitous. Most servers are coming with the most laptops. So I guess in a lot of you have got ThinkPads. They all have TPM 2.0 chips. Uh, they're pretty cheap to buy and retrofit. In most servers, we're talking like 20, 30 euros. So I have a Raspberry Pi, and you can see at the uh, top right, uh, sorry, top center, there's a small GPIO board that I plugged on, and that's a TPM, and that was like 20 euros. So, you know, these things are pretty cheap. They're starting to appear in a lot of uh, automobiles as well. So people use the TPM to uh, establish the, the, uh, the engine control unit and the braking systems and the safety systems are not being tampered with, because we're starting to see that quite a lot, people hacking into cars and, and uh, uh, playing with the, the metrics of the braking system, which is, of course, very dangerous. Now, these chips, um, they have a, an RSA key pair. That's kind of putting it in a very simple term, but they have a, a, the private part is inaccessible to software. Okay, so it has its own private key that it can use for creating further keys and signing artifacts. And that is siloed off completely from software. It's, it's very much locked within that chip, and it's created at manufacture time. And we'll go into that quite soon. It's called an entity key. And the other thing that TPMs can do alongside uh, you know, creating keys and, and so forth is, is they can do this uh, signing of artifacts. So essentially, when I say, well, sorry, not, not signing, measuring of artifacts. So this is essentially taking a cryptographic hash of an object, a firmware blob, a file, uh, the, uh, the bootloader, kernel options, kernel modules. All of these things are measured with a cryptographic hash. So typically a SHA-256 hash. And those are then recorded into the TPM. Okay? And the TPM does some other funky things where it, it sort of it measures an object, and then the next object to load is then measured. And then the two hashes are concatenated together, and then a hash of those hashes is made. And that creates something called a one-way hash function, which is very quick to, to generate but incredibly difficult to unfold and go backwards and change something. So now these hashes can be made public. Okay, it's a measurement list. And the measurement list is signed with this private counterpart, this RSA key. So the public key can be made available for you to attest that that measurement list has actually come from a, a real TPM and that nobody's tampered with it. And that's what allows this functional area that we call remote attestation, essentially. And that's, that's one of the uh, core pieces of functionality that, that Keyline relies upon. So a little bit more about Keyline. Um, it's, uh, we call it a remote trust framework because we do a lot more than just a test. A lot of the core tenets of what we do, our functionality is based on the attestation and us establishing, establishing a trust state, but there's quite a bit more to it than that. Uh, we are, it's a very scalable solution. So this was one of the things that the people that originally worked on this idea got right. It's, it's very easy to scale this. It's very performant. So it's asynchronous. It's non-blocking uh, non IO network. So the TPMs tend to be a little bit slow. So that way we don't get a bottleneck. So we can have our, our verifier scale to, to monitoring thousands and thousands of machines that have uh, TPMs. <coughs> Uh, we support the latest standard, TPM 2.0. We also support 1.2, but that's getting quite old now, so we'll be depreciating that. We're not developing any more functionality for that version. And originally, Keyline was born out of MIT, uh, Lincoln Lab Security Research Department. They wrote a white paper, put together a prototype, and then um, I discovered the project about a year ago, and uh, you know, I really liked the core design tenants that they had, the scalability, the sort of the, the use cases that they built on top of it. And I saw it as a promising project, so, so that's where I, I got involved myself. So Keyline provides 
measured boot. That's uh, probably one of the first fundamentals. So by measured boot, I mean we can measure the firmware, the shim. So the Red Hat shim project allows uh, a TPM to measure boot components, which is one of the, the key parts that we use. Uh, Grub, the kernel options. So for example, uh, kernel options can toggle, uh, toggle on and off SE Linux or audit or there's various powerful flags that can be changed on the uh, Grub command line kernel options. <clears throat> so we can actually measure those as well to make sure nobody's tampered with those. Uh, the init RAM FS and the, the modules. And then further into user land, which we'll go to next. Uh, so also secure boot, so there's various parts of secure boot, DBX, mock, the uh, mock list, vendor DPX, various certificates. We can make sure that nobody's tampered with those. And then we have IMA, which is Integrity Measurement Architecture. And IMA is part of the Linux security subsystem. And it's been there since release 2.7, I think. So it's, it's very well established. It's quite an old timer in the kernel, so we don't have to worry about any young upstarts coming along and taking its comfy chair is pretty much well settled as, a, as, a, as a, a key Linux security subsystem. And with IMA, uh, every time a syscall comes in and tries to execute some ink, uh, IMA will take a hash of that, so a cryptographic hash, let's say look at a sum, and it will uh, extend that into the TPM, and then we can remotely attest that. So that happens at execution time. So, for example, if somebody was to swap out a binary, I don't know, we could have something like the IP binary, and they swap it out with a Trojanized binary. It's obviously going to have a different cryptographic checksum, so we'll be able to remotely see within seconds of that executing that somebody's actually changed that binary and take actions from there. Also, the same for um, kernel modules as they load and SE Linux labels and changes and so forth. And so, essentially, we've got the initial boot of the system, secure boot, and then runtime. So we can measure all of these components remotely. The other thing we have as well is uh, an encrypted payload and execution framework. So what we do is when a system proves its trust, so we, do know, we know that nobody's tampered with that system, we can then release an encrypted payload on that machine. So that could be, for example, uh, some private secrets that you have or certain files that have passwords or sensitive materials in. So the machine will prove its trust state, it's not been compromised, and then we will then release an encrypted payload. If the machine fails to suggest that somebody has somehow tampered with that machine, they cannot access the payload. <clears throat> and finally, we have something called a, a revocation framework. So this essentially happens when a machine fails. So if somebody tampers with a machine, then uh, we interface with a certificate authority. Typically, we use Cloudflare SSL. So we can revoke a certificate, and that certificate revocation, in turn, could invalidate IPsec tunnels or TLS connections and so forth. And then we also have these things called custom actions. And these are where you delegate a list of scripts that are written in Python. And what happens is all of the nodes that are part of the key line cluster, what they will do is they will execute these local actions when one node fails. And typically what you would do is you get those nodes to stonif the node that's failed. So stonif, if anybody's not familiar, that's, uh, I should know this, it's uh, shoot the offending node in the head, essentially. So ring fence it. So here it's very flexible. You can essentially, anything that's programmatically possible on a, a Linux machine within Python, you can execute that locally. So it could be calling specific APIs, it could be shutting down network connections, uh, removing hosts from an authorized SSH key file, anything that you come up with, really. It, you, can, you can set a script, and then Keyline will execute that script once a node fails. So a bit of a high-level overview of the different components. So first of all, we have the agent. So, so what we've got here is to our left, is consider that the sort of the remote data center or perhaps uh, an outside location where you have an IoT device or an edge device. This is essentially, essentially an area that's outside of your control, outside of your network. Okay. And uh, 
this is where we run the key lime agent. And the key lime agent communicates with the TPM. So it requests these quotes. And quotes are essentially a request to get a measurement list of the current cryptographic state of the system, which is then sent to the verifier, which is now on premise. So this would be something that you have within your, your own trusted boundary. And the verifier uh, accepts these lists. Okay, uh, It does a, a, a check to make sure that it's a real TPM that sent that using the private key hierarchy that I spoke of earlier with the TPM. And it then performs a, a kind of a comparison between current state and what the expected state is. Now, if that state changes, then the verifier will then fail that node. And then we'll have our revocations and so forth. But before we get onto that, there's also the register. The register is relatively simple. It's a database. It's where we store the agent IDs, their unique IDs, their operational state. And we also keep the public keys of the TPM vendors. So normally they'll provide like an intermediate certificate, which can then be used to vouch that a, v, that a TPM is actually a real TPM. And it's not a spoofed actor pretending to be a TPM. <coughs> we then have our revocation service. And the revocation service is like I described earlier. When a machine fails, then we can have a series of scripts which kick off on all of the other machines to ring fence that particular machine. And likewise, it will also connect to a certificate authority. And at the moment, we support OpenSSL and Cloudflare SSL. But we're going to move this to be in a plug-in framework so we can easily integrate with other CAs. All they have to do is write their own driver. OK, so this is where it gets a bit hand-wavy. So, um, you know, do pull me up afterwards if, if something doesn't make sense. So initially, we have to set up something called a hardware root of trust. Okay, so we need to establish, is this actually a real TPM that I'm talking to? Okay. So what happens is the key lime agent, so remember this is the remote machine that we're monitoring. Uh, this will send an ID. There's no cryptographic properties to the ID. It's just a unique identifier. And it will send two public keys, an EKPUB and an AKPUB. Now, an EK is the entity key, okay? And this entity key is burnt at manufacture time into the TPM, okay? So nobody can get hold of that. Theoretically, <coughs> not even the TPM manufacturer themselves. What happens is they, I don't know it too fluently, but they inject a random seed, and then it sort of self-bootstraps its own cryptography and creates this entity key, which is locked within the chip. And then the entity key also creates an attestation key. So the, attest the, attest <coughs> excuse me, the attestation key can be, um, it's not fixed to the hardware. So if you was to re reset a TPM, then the AK would be wiped and you would generate a new one. Whereas the entity key is a permanent fixture to the TPM. So we send the public counterparts and the ID to the register. And what the register does is, using the public key, it encrypts the AK pub using a hash made with a key which we call the KE, which is essentially a challenge. Okay? So we're challenging the machine to say, prove to us that you have the private counterpart of the entity key. Okay? So what will happen is the agent will then make a HMAC of its ID, and it will send that back to prove that it actually has the EK private key. And then further to that, we'll also verify that the EK private key, uh, sorry, public key, is signed by an actual TPM manufacturer as well. And that allows us to then tie the attestation key to the entity key. So now what we can do is when we receive a cryptographic quote from a machine, we can be sure that it's an actual real TPM that signed that. So that is a bit hand wavy, isn't it? So, so hopefully that, that went in. It took me a while to understand this stuff as well. So now we've got our hardware router trust set up. So we, we can now trust the hardware. So the second part is we do an initial attestation of the state of the machine. Okay. So now you can see that we introduce, I don't know if there's a laser on this. No. Now you can see at the top there's a verifier. So the verifier is coming into the picture now. So what we do is 
Uh, sorry, and there's a four factor as well, the key line, key line tenant, okay? Now, the key line tenant is essentially, this is you as the user drive this, okay? And we provide a, a CLI, so you can type commands with arguments to, to kick off this process. But that CLI actually wraps around REST APIs. So if somebody had their own system, they could obviously develop their own system around our REST APIs to drive this. And what happens is the tenant creates a key, which we call the bootstrap key. Okay? And this key is cryptographically split into two. So it's not a file that's split into two. It's actually uh, done in a cryptographic manner. Okay? And that makes the two counterparts, the U and the V. And we use this for unlocking the encrypted payload. And we'll see how we do that sh uh, shortly. <coughs> so first of all, we send the V part to the verifier. So this is the V part being half of the bootstrap key. Okay. And we also send an agent ID, again, just a unique identifier, an IP address, and a whitelist. Okay. And the whitelist is um, a list of hashes and a POSIX path to a file. So you essentially have a hash value of a file to the right, two columns, pretty simple. And that's your golden state of how you expect the system to be. Okay. The verifier then sends a nonce to the keyline agent, because we want to make sure it's fresh. We don't want somebody to try and send an old quote. So we send a nonce to make sure there's no replay attacks and so forth. And then the agent will communicate with the TPM, and it will send back this TPM quote, okay, which is using the nonce, it hashes the attestation key of a value called a PCR, which is a platform configuration register. And these are letter boxes where there's hash measurements that are stored in the TPM. Okay? And this is sent back. And it also sends a, a public counterpart of a new key called the NK. Okay? And the NK is something that we use to protect transferring secrets from the agent, uh, sorry, from the, the, uh, the verifier and the tenant to the agent itself. Now, when this comes back, we first of all check the validity of this attestation key, which goes back to the previous slide where we had the hardware root of trust. So again, we make sure that this is actually a real TPM that we've established a hardware root of trust with. If that trust passed, then the verifier will hand over the V counterpart, and it will use the NK key that we spoke about, the NK public key to do that. So it's done in a, a secure manner. So this can all happen over HTTP, and it's absolutely fine. There's no problem with that. This can happen across completely untrusted networks. <clears throat> now, the second part is we now need to get the U part of the key, second part of the key, over to the agent so that it can unlock a payload. So now as the tenant, we request a quote, okay? And with this quote, we're not actually measuring the system. It's just a way of us uh, showing intent to the machine to prove its, its uh, identity. So we use a, a quote to do this. And it comes back with a quote that's signed by the attestation key, so we can again check the hardware root of trust. And the agent also sends its NK pub, which we, we will use to safely transit the second part of the key. Okay. Uh, again, we'll check the trust, check the trust state, the hardware root of trust. And then if that is shown to be non-compromised, uh, we will use in the NK pub, we will send the U counterpart, the second counterpart of the key, over to the remote host along with a payload, which is just essentially a tarball. Okay, and we'll go into what the payload would typically contain shortly. So the agent then combines the keys again to one key. Now it has that full key. The secrets are unlocked. And then we have a deploy hook. So we have a script that will run, which could do anything. You could call an Ansible playbook. Uh, you could have a, perhaps a, a bash script that deploys an application. It's essentially up to you then. So here's an example of a, a very simple example of an encrypted payload. So you can see we have our payload.tar, and in there we've got various secrets that we want to, 
we want to securely transmit to a machine, once we know that nobody's tampered with that machine, we can actually trust the environment. So you can see there's various secrets and binaries. And then at the bottom, you'll see these scripts that are prefixed with local actions. Now, these are the scripts that are executed when a machine fails its state. So, for example, these two scripts are making some calls with kubectl around a cluster, and they're also making some changes to IP tables. So, essentially, what we're going to do is, when a machine fails, a signed event will be sent out to all the machines. They'll run these scripts locally, and that will ring fence the compromised machine. And then you can see there's an auto run.sh, which we automatically execute, again, on once the trust is passed, the keys are combined, the payload's made available, we will execute the auto run.sh script. And in here, you can see a, a simple example. It calls an Ansible playbook. So the idea is you would deliver the secrets, Ansible would run, deploy the application, and your secrets are there, and you know that they've gone onto a machine that you can trust. Now, once this happens, we move into the third phase, which is continuous integration. So we've measured the boot, uh, the secure boot components. Uh, we've cryptographically delivered the payload. Now we want to continuously monitor that machine for compromise. So here we use integrity measurement architecture. And what happens is we continuously poll for these TPM quotes. And this actually happens over a REST API. And you don't even need to protect that. It doesn't even need to be on HTTPS. It could be on HTTP because these measurements, as I say, are cryptographically signed by a key, which is locked within the TPM. So if anybody tried to tamper with those measurements, it's going to break the cryptography and it's going to fail. So the TPM quote comes back, and we then move into continuous polling. So we do this about every two seconds. Okay? And what will happen is... Every time somebody makes a sys call or they make some sort of a change, IMA will write this to the security FS, okay? And the security FS will then lodge the hash that it's recorded into the TPM. And then we query the TPM for the measurement list. So within, as I say, we typically do polls of around two seconds. You could do more. So within a second or two of somebody running something on the system, if there's been a change to the object that's running, we will know about it, and we can immediately then shoot that machine off the network. <clears throat> so remember earlier we sent our whitelist, our golden state of hashes of what we expect the file system to be. So IMA populates the security FS into the TPM, and then Keylima tests the runtime trust state using IMA. And then somebody compromises the machine. There's an integrity failure. So we'll now look at the next part, which will be the revocation framework. Okay, so the actions that we'll take once a machine fails its, its trust state. So for example, here you can see we've got the keyline verifier. We've got our certificate authority. And then we've got four nodes that are all being monitored. Okay, so these could be like a, an OpenShift cluster or, or, or any sort of type of machine, essentially. Uh, one machine is compromised, so somebody runs a script as root that's not whitelisted, or they uh, somehow trojanize a file, or they, they do something that tampers with the state of the system. Immediately, the verifier will send out a, certific a certificate revocation using a certificate revocation list to invalidate that certificate. And then if that certificate is used for uh, the TLS connections of a machine, obviously you're going to invalidate those connections. Or it could be used for IPsec or, or any sort of uh, solution which uses a, a certificate authority. And then the other event that it does is it, signs out these, it sends out these revocation events. And these are essentially, it's a list of metadata. And you can place whatever metadata you like into this uh, revocation list. Typically we have stuff like IP address or host name. And, uh, and, and, and parts that have failed and so forth. But you, you can customize this list. And this is signed by the verifier. So you know that it's an actual real verifier that you trust that is sending this out. And it's not a hacker pretending to be a verifier and causing havoc by sending out these events. <clears throat> so yeah, so these events are received by the machines, which then 
informs them to run the, the local actions. And these are these Python scripts that we looked at earlier, which can then programmatically do whatever you like. They can make shell executions or call APIs or, or take any sort of determined action that you'd like to take when a machine fails a state. So for, for, <coughs> excuse me, for, for some examples, uh, we could um, remove the failed node from SSH authorized keys. It's a very simple example. Or we could shut down a VPN tunnel or amend some IP table rules. There's, you know, wh whatever you want to do. Like I say, this is all, this is all, uh, it's all uh, outlined in scripts. <clears throat> and then we can call the certificate authority, certificate authority to make a, a revocation. So there is actually um, a demo that I put up recently on the Red Hat community YouTube site. And what we do is we monitor three etcd machines that are part of a cluster. We then compromise one of the machines, in this instance etcd2, which causes the verifier to send out these revocation events. And these revocation events tell the leader to remove etcd from the cluster. And it does some other things as well, like shreds some secrets and so forth that are, that are associated with that particular node. So if anybody's interested, you can, you can watch that video. Uh, we also have some examples as well using Libra, Swan, and Raccoon. But like I say, this is Python. So anything that you can do within Python, you can do on your machine. You know, see, it's really is the, it's, it's up to you. You, you, you can, the world's your oyster, essentially. Anything that you want to achieve, and automate programmatically, you can do so, and Keyline will start that for you. So we try to keep ourselves being uh, agnostic when it comes to use cases, and have the user really use their imagination around what they would like to do when a machine fails. So a little bit about the project and the community and, and where we are at present. So as I say, we're relatively young, but we're continuously growing. Uh, organically, com contributors are coming along and finding the project, which is really nice. And, uh, you know, the volume of commits is increasing, and all the metrics say that it's a, it's a nice growing open source project. Uh, we meet weekly, okay, and all of our meeting notes are GitHub issues. We've got a meetings repository, and this works really well because we can link to pull requests and comments, and then... Uh, GitHub will automatically reference that we've pointed to them, and it really helps tie everything together. And we also have a, a Gitter. Gitter's like a kind of a, I guess, like a Slack sort of type messaging platform where we, um, where we meet. And anybody that's trying to use Keylime and wants to get it to do something or doesn't understand how something works or wants a bit of support can come along, jump on. And we're a pretty friendly bunch, and we'll, we'll help you achieve or discuss particular use case or something that you'd like to achieve. So currently what we're working on is um, our, our agent, so the agent being the component that runs on the remote machine, that's currently in Python and we're porting that to Rust. Okay. And the reasons for this are Rust is arguably a bit more performant because there's no garbage collection and so forth. And it's also there's very good security, so the compiler is pretty strict around ownership and so forth. So you get good memory safety and thread safety. Uh, we're working on vTPM support. So at the moment, we work with a hardware TPM. There are virtual TPMs, but the problem with a virtual TPM is you're back to that issue of your secrets being on disk because the, the virtual TPM will store... It's, it's emulated, and it's running within the virtual machine. So you don't get that true hardware root of trust with a vTPM. So the guys at MIT and some interns from Boston University, uh, they came up with a proposal that allows us to extend the trust from the hardware TPM to many virtual TPMs. But we don't absolutely bomb them the, the hardware TPM and cause a bottleneck. So what we're doing is... We're aggregating all of the quotes into a Merkle tree, and then we can have a single operation against the hardware TPM, which will then allow us to test many, many, many vTPMs, and there not be any sort of throughput issues. So this will allow us mass scale 
and it extends that hardware root of trust. So this is something that's been worked on at the moment. Um, VTPM support is available in QEMU. It's pretty well established. And there's a patch into uh, the container runtime as well for VTPM support. And that's looking close to merging soon. It's, it's in pretty good state. So we hope in within uh, perhaps as short as a few months, this might be there to try out and, and uh, use. We've got a prototype that's working that people can look at. Uh, lots of other stuff as well. So we're revamping the UI. Uh, we're working on a token system to build the initial stages of multi-tenancy. So at the moment, for um, authentication, we're relying on mutual and server TLS, but we're going to use uh, uh, Java web tokens so that we can scope tokens and have some form of, uh, of uh, multi-tenancy and access control. Uh, for the revocation events, we're going to set up different levels. So at the moment, what happens is a node will fail, whereas we want to have like a, a kind of a less serious action level of notify. So that means not necessarily blow the machine off the network, but perhaps monitor it more closely. Uh, we're working on, well, we haven't started yet, but we're going to hopefully have some sort of repository, kind of like a galaxy, where people can share revocation scripts that they've developed. These are the scripts that, for example, shut down network connections or terminate VPN tunnels or, or update IP table rules or call a part of Kubernetes or a part of OpenStack and so forth. Uh, we're packaged into Rawhide. So Fedora 32, you'll be able to install Keyline. Uh, we're starting to look at how we can integrate with Fedora Core OS and IoT. So Keylime, I should mention here, is, is a very good fit for sort of your cloud computing type scenario of a cloud consumer and a, and a cloud provider, but it's also very good for IoT as well. So anything that's remotely outside of your trust boundaries, that's where Keylime comes in. Uh, OpenStack and OpenShift integration, we're starting to look at that. And evangelism, which is what I'm currently doing at the moment, which is getting out and, and talking about Keylime to people. So, um, how are we doing for time? Good, okay, we're good, we're good. So, um, this is kind of like a, a, a kind of like come and join us type pitch. So, at the moment, we're looking for anybody to help out. It doesn't even need to be an engineer. You might be somebody that's a user, an architect. You are like writing documentation. Anybody that can contribute is welcome. And, and as I said in the previous meeting, we... We try to be really welcoming, inclusive. You know, we support new people. You know, we know what it's like to approach a new project and try to get a pull request merged. So, so I mean, I'll personally go out my way to, to help anybody that's going to contribute to the project. Uh, you don't need to be a security guru. Okay, so you don't need to understand crypto to a really deep level. We've got lots of stuff around standard login frameworks, little bugs that need fixing typos, spelling, all sorts of stuff. So if you even know basic level of Python, then you can come in and get your feet wet and, and, and help contribute as well. And we have other stuff such as Ansible roles that are available, and, and so there's, there's lots of stuff to work on. Our documentation needs a lot of love. So, you know, there's, there's lots to do, and so you don't expect to be some crypto math genius or anything like that. It's really a, that's only a small part of the system, and that's pretty much complete now. It's just about making things more, more resilient and robust and mature. So we have a website, uh, keylime.dev. If you go onto there, then you'll find out where our GitHub is, where we meet, where our white paper is, and so forth. That'll point you towards everything. And as I said earlier, we've got a, a community chat channel. Uh, if you've seen anything which you think is perhaps a little bit concerning, Maybe don't share it in a public area. We've got a security disclosure list that you can report security vulnerability to. We're a young project. We're trying to do things the right way. But you know, as I say, if you've spotted something and it's a little bit questionable, you can always pull me afterwards, or we have our responsible disclosure system. Uh, last of all, you can test drive Keylime in a VM. So we've got an Ansible role. Uh, it comes with a Vagrant file. It's most of you are familiar with Vagrant. Uh, this will allow you to Vagrant up 
and it will call a, an Ansible hook which will install Keylime. It will install a software TPM emulator so you'll be able to log in and run Keylime and then perform all of the, the sort of use cases that we have. So we've made it really simple for people to, to get involved. And uh, we also use this as a development tool where we mount a local code repository into the virtual machine and, and run tests and so forth. We have got Keylime running in a container as well. So you, you can run it in a container. The only caveat with these two is that we don't have that VTPM hardware trust extended. But if you just want to play with things, use it as a sandbox, develop some stuff, test some stuff, it's perfectly adequate for that. So I think at that juncture, which is quite good because my voice is going, I don't know if you could hear that, my voice is starting to give out, I can uh, take some questions if anybody has any. Hey, sure. Uh, first of all, thank you for conducting the test at the community as well here. I just don't have some time to prove this. Yeah, yeah, sure. Good to meet you. Uh, yeah. yeah. And so, indeed, you're welcome, and I encourage others to continue as well. Um, so, a few questions. I've just got some notes wrote down. Uh, you mentioned um, we could have a white list of files we want to. Um, Control maybe, and I was thinking maybe that could be hooked into Sweetstack because they provide the kind of simply checksum of the file as well. I saw you who? Uh, sweet, sweet stacks. Oh, Can you repeat the question as well for the microphone. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, the, the question was around uh, the whitelist and the hashes that we have, and there's a system that provides these you, you mentioned? It provides any checksums of the files in an RPM, for example. Oh, I see. Yeah, like an RPM header. Yeah, very good point. So, so that stuff that we're actually exploring is there are some patches around um, taking the hash from an RPM header and then recording that in integrity measurement architecture, which then extends into the TPM. So that's something that we're following because that will make whitelist management a lot more easy. And the other one as well is with immutable operating systems. Obviously, they can change with RPM OS tree, but they're, they're pretty static to a, to a degree. So with the structure of um, uh, you have a commit history, you know, and there's, there's a, a checksum for a particular commit release of that operating system, we're going to start to look into ways that we can perhaps generate whitelists from those as well to make it a lot more easy to, to measure. So the sort of vision is that if somebody, I might be using the wrong words here, and there's somebody from CoreOS that can pull me up, but if somebody changes operating system version, they load a different commit hash of that OS tree, then they would have a whitelist immediately available that they can then attest that that has happened correctly. You know, they, so, so that the way they can, uh, they can check the security integrity, but also the operational integrity that they've actually got that right particular image point that they wish to have deployed. Cool. Yeah. And I've got a related question. Sure. Because there's a um, plugin for RPM D2 to um, generate IMA signatures. Okay. The RPM packages as well. So uh -huh. that could be um, like decent and then people use it or not. Yeah, I, I'd love to explore this stuff. So we should... We should connect and have a look at that, definitely, yeah, yeah. Because this is one of the things with whitelists. They're a little bit of a, there's, al there's always been the problem of, of you, you can have like a, a, a kind of golden s set of hashes of your machine state. And what we typically do is um, uh, we take init ramfs and then we iterate through all the files using a SHA-256 sum. So we build a hash list. But then what happens if somebody runs DNF update, and all of those hashes changes. So this makes it a lot of overhead for an admin. Mm. So this is where we want to find these better ways of, of sourcing whitelists. And, uh, and it seems like there's a good few things coming along that's going to really make that a lot easier. Cool. OK, um, this chap here. Yep. Yeah. Um, what about uh, uh, Lux verification of the header? Is there any work that's been done around that? Um, because with yeah, so the, the, the question was around what about verification of the LUX header, okay? Um, 
I'm not too much of an expert on Lux, but we do measure secure boot. So I believe that has a, a level of interaction with Lux. Well, so it's, it's, it's normally when Lux comes up, uh, it, it, you do have the NetRAM FS, but yeah. there is no integrity check to see if the Lux header is valid or if it's been replaced. Oh, I see. Like for, for example, if, uh, as an attack vector, if yeah. I have an old version of the Lux header, yeah. and you change your username, mm. or uh, sorry, user passphrase, mm. then the, um, I can overwrite uh, the, the header with the old one. Understand. And at that point, I can use the old passphrase to unlock the, the hard disk. I see, yeah. So something like that, we could look at extending into the TPM. So, you know, if, if we can hash an artifact, then we can cryptographically extend it into the TPM. So, yeah, I'd yeah. have to chat with you about that. Yeah, definitely, yeah. Like I say, anything like this, I'd, it would be great to talk about it. And we can prototype some stuff and see what we can do. So, uh, this, Luke, I want to add to that. Yeah. Stick around for the network bound system discussion going on, because the large header can be actually encrypted into the TPM for a signature hash. Oh, really? Uh, it's been shipping since RHEL 7.6. Yeah, because I was uh, 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 worked on the uh, Red Hat disk encryption, so I've, I've mm -hmm. been seeing emails yep. from, from We've been there. able to tie ah. TPM and Lux together since 7.6 with Netherbound. Well, there you go. Yeah, cool. right. we'll stick around. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it's this gentleman at the front. Yeah, uh, we've been uh, talking with a lot of customers about uh, containers mm. and the integrity in terms of uh, vulnerabilities that can be introduced by uh, third parties uh, with uh, real, like a real image in a container, mm. but it's not the real one. But mm. And uh, now all the vulnerability uh, tools are just uh, uh, looking at the RPMs or package manager uh, versions to mm. double check if there is any kind of vulnerability right now. Mm. Uh, do you think that kind of technology could be uh, used for uh, getting some uh, hash and check every single file in a container just to double check that apart from having real, uh, not vulnerable RPMs, mm. also every file in the container can be, uh, can be secured by this hash? Yeah, we could do that using uh, IMA. So we're waiting for IMA to be namespaced. That's something that's happening. So we, we're relying on a few things landing, a few patches. But yeah, you'll be able to build a, a golden state of hashes of how you expect that container image to be. And then that will be monitored. And then if somebody changes those, for example, a virus or malware or something overwrites certain files, you know, it could be your Python site packages or your Go binaries or, or whatever, then you will be able to remotely know that that container's been compromised. And then using the local actions revocation system that we have, you can then, uh, you can sort of uh, make calls into Kubernetes or the container runtime to, to sort of fail a, uh, you know, a, a cluster or a pod or, or just a single container or, yeah. So that would be possible, but we just need a few patches to kind of land and, and uh, but it's, it's looking promising. They're, they're making good progress. Okay, five minutes left. Any other questions? Cool. Okay, so like I say, I'll be here for the rest of the day. So do come and grab me. You know, there's some, some interesting stuff to talk about. And uh, thanks for your time. And I, I think I've been straying outside the camera a lot. So I tend to do that. I tend to wander around a lot. So apologies to anybody watching. And uh, thank you. <laughs>